Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. We wanted to tackle the topic of secrets. It's a very rich topic. And as we started looking at it, we recognized how many layers this subject has and how relevant it can be to all of our lives and also to analytic work. The first thing that comes up for me is that I think almost every NLSN that's ever come into the consulting room starts with this pain of some kind of a secret, yeah, something that they're holding alone and that the burden of holding it alone has, has begun to make them feel unwell and symptomatic. Mm -hmm. And it's not as if they really know often what the secret is. Uh, there may be a part that's in consciousness, but there's a deeper part. And Jung has a beautiful quotation about that. And it goes like this, the patient who comes to us has a story that is not told and which, as a rule, no one knows of. To my mind, therapy only really begins after the investigation of the holy personal story. It is the patient's secret, the rock against which he has been shattered. If I know his secret story, I have the key to the treatment. The doctor's task is to find out how to gain the knowledge in most cases, exploration of conscious material is insufficient. So th that's a beautiful, I think, introduction to this dual aspect of secrets, the, the part we know and are consciously protecting from anyone else's knowledge, and the unconscious part that we don't know about ourselves. Yeah, so we can have a secret from ourselves, can't we? Exactly. I think the secret from ourselves goes into the idea of repression, that there's something that we're thinking, fantasizing, or experiencing that our psychological system finds so um, unacceptable that it cuts that secret away from the conscious life and pushes it into the unconscious where it continues to rumble and have an effect from a distance, which could be rather minor, because some secrets really don't need to be secrets. We've just somehow stuffed them in there. But sometimes the secrets are enough to make people really, really unwell, and unwell in very strange, indirect ways. Well, I suppose that we could think about having a secret from ourselves as another possible definition for neurosis, building on what you're saying, Joseph. Yes. That it's this content that has been disallowed for some reason, that in some cases can build up a lot of energy attached to it and create symptoms and tension and, and inner conflict that sometimes we don't even understand where it's coming from, but we just have a sense of dis-ease. And if the neurotic or the cutoff part of ourselves is strong enough, it can become a complex. And Jung thought of that as a kind of cluster of psychological energy that actually has an independent life inside of us and can sweep us around um, in ways that are, can be very unpredictable and mysterious. Exactly. So do you, do you think that we could say that there is a secret at the heart of every complex? Yes, uh, either a secret from the conscious mind or a secret from the community, but I would say yes. I think so too. I think uh, that that is really where secrets that are the most troublesome reside, is in the unconscious, and they become complexes. Uh, they are split off. It's unconsciously expressed. And so people do come in all the time with, 
you know, some kind of a problem that indicates a complex, you know, such as fear of using the subway or fear of using elevators. And the task here is, you know, what is underneath that? What is really uh, trying to be expressed, which is what Jung thought that every symptom is an attempt at self-cure. So while we're talking about this idea of secrets being related to complexes, what comes up for me is Jung's word association test, which he pioneered in the first decade of the 20th century uh, at the Berkholsley in Zurich. And uh, the word association test consists of uh, the analyst reading a stimulus word and asking the patient to say the first word that comes into his or her mind, and that's the response word. And what Jung noticed was that some stimulus words in some patients would produce a kind of disturbance. It might be, it might take the person an especially long time to respond, or they might respond in a word that seems really uncharacteristic, or there might be physical symptoms that went along with responding to that word. And Jung thought that these responses revealed a kind of inner disturbance and he often talked about that these revealed secrets. They do reveal uh, secrets. There's something there that can be, you know, sort of puzzled out of which words, and most of the words are pretty ordinary words like tree, table, water. What is the pattern that underlies these delayed responses or otherwise not easy and natural responses. So they indicate complexes or secrets that we have from ourselves. I, I can share that when I was in training, a colleague and I, another trainee and I did the word association test. And both of us, I think, were incredibly surprised that indeed uh, we did balk or delay at certain words and one of the words I simply could not come up with an association to was the word boat. Now, that seems like a pretty innocuous word, and I just could not think of any way to associate to it. You know, one could uh, think of rowboat or oars or water or a hundred things. And I took some time in analysis after that to read up on and discuss and associate to boat because I was so curious about what on earth had set me off. What I realized later on was that boats are those little fragile vessels of ego or consciousness floating upon the deep, which is the unconscious of water, especially things like the ocean. Uh, so there was a secret mm -hmm. that my secret sense of unease and fragility in exploring the unconscious deeps of the waters in my own little boat. So sometimes the, the words evoke a kind of almost archetypal effect or that they're so potent in the fantasy material that they bring forward that they can kind of stun the ego something like an existential concern, like the relative fragility of the ego in relationship to the unconscious. Many people's neurotic reactions are based on uh, lived experiences that were just particularly confusing to them mm -hmm. and or have to do with categories of uncomfortable memories. So Jung says that the mildest forms of this kind of splitting, secret making, could be just slips of the tongue. The idea that <laughs> Freudian slips, that people just say something, and they don't know how or why they blurted it out. Um, suddenly forgetting people's names or dates, uh, becoming suddenly clumsy, which leads to an accident. Various misunderstandings or what he called hallucinations of memory where we swear that we've said something or done something <laughs> or didn't, and we feel absolutely certain or heard somebody else, we absolutely believe somebody else said something. It really didn't happen at all. But um, these split off parts can have such a stunning effect. And the one exception that he gave is when people had an enormous trauma. At that 
point, you know, it's 1920, 30, 40, we're getting people from the world wars, you know, are, are showing up and they're shell shocked, which is the beginning of this PTSD considerations. And he said the kinds of events or reactions that people have with shell shock wouldn't fall into the idea of the normal neurotic interference, but was something that was much more neurologic and physical. So, so this really shows um, how deep a secret can be, that it can reside in the unconscious in the form of a complex or some kind of neurotic adaptation to life. But I'm thinking of other realms, too, in which secrets arise. Yeah, the things that we, we know, but we're somehow not allowed to know. Oh, a common experience of that in the consulting room is, you know, you grow up in a house where one of your parents is an alcoholic. You know, it's obvious, everyone in the family knows it, but there is this explicit or implicit declaration that no one is to know this is happening. This is an absolute secret because we would lose status or cause all kinds of problems in the community. I, I'm thinking, too, about uh, how that goes in between consciousness and unconsciousness. You know that we may know that there's something wrong with this particular relative or parent, that every weekend there's a shift in mood and erratic or peculiar or scary behavior. But A, we're not supposed to tell anybody, and also we're not supposed to really know it ourselves as children. There may be a kind of family code that says we pretend that this person is okay or we just give this person a wide berth every weekend because he's tired or he's uh, stressed or she's stressed. So there's a place where we know and we don't know. That line is not always so clear. And I think that this example of an alcoholic family member is a classic way that family secrets show up. There often is this injunction in families not to know and not to talk about uh, an, an alcoholic problem. And it, it brings up this other issue that's related to secrets is often what goes along with having a secret like this is a deep sense of shame. Particularly when part of the fantasy around the secret is that if it were known, that I or the family would be shamed or ridiculed. But I think that there's a fantasy material that's going to determine whether it's a terrifying secret or a shameful secret or some, some other content around it. Uh, you know, I'm thinking that there is a great example of a family secret in a book by Tara Westover. It'll be in the show notes. It's called Educated, where the family's self-image of itself would also have been affected. So that is more than shame. It is a belief system. And she writes very explicitly about a brother who was violently abusive uh, and many other family secrets, but it was important to this family's sense of sort of a cohesiveness and a persona that some of these abuses and erratic behavior on the part of this brother, uh, her father, and others would have shattered the family belief system its image of itself uh, that was so important to cover up an underlying fragility. In addition to, if people had known, there would have been shame and guilt from other people kind of wagging their fingers. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but that book is a, is a terrific, um, lifts up to, in a terrifically good way what family secrets can do and look like. You know, Jung said that the possession of a secret cuts a person off from his fellow human beings. And in this realm of family secrets, it's true, I think, that if we're holding a secret about an abusive family member or an alcoholic family member, there is a way that that secret creates a kind of neurotic isolation where we do not feel like we belong to the rest of humanity. Yeah, I think that the self-isolation or the emotional walling off that the individual psyche does 
kind of changes how people move through the social environment. Um, the feeling that if someone could see me or looked at me deeply enough, that they would perceive this terrible flaw. And then we have to set up systems to make sure that we are not perceived in one way or another. Mm -hmm. And that could, that takes up so much psychic energy to have to keep up this facade and keep on hiding behind things so that our secret doesn't get revealed. It, it, it really takes up a lot of our energy that could otherwise be used for life. It's a high price to pay. Yeah, that Jung talks about it as a, a kind of psychic poison, that it works through the system in a way that makes us really feel sick. And I think we probably have had all this experience, even if we were just children, that you know maybe we've uh, done an infraction or we broke something in the house, we're six years old, and then all of a sudden one of the parents are walking in, who did this? <laughs> and you can see these hilarious YouTube videos of, you know, like there's a kid there with a Sharpie and then their infant sibling is next to them with Sharpie all over their face. <laughs> you know, and the mother's like, who did this? And the kid's just standing there with the Sharpie going, no, no, I am no. <laughs> That's where so, it really helps to have a sibling in situations like that. <laughs> <laughs> but this instinct to keep secrets, I mean, you can see this in, in little toddlers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It tells us there's something archetypal about this. On the other hand, I'm thinking uh, about Jung's secret when he was a child. Uh, he had a little matchbox and a little mannequin figure that he had made, and he hid it uh, way up on a beam in the attic, if I'm remembering this accurately. And it pleased him inordinately to know that he had this secret of this little figure in his matchbox, you know, up in this place that nobody ever went. And it can help us, it can help us differentiate and have a private special thing that we keep to ourselves. Yeah. I mean, I think as we were saying a minute ago, we often keep things that are shameful or frightening secret but it's also true that we keep things secret when they're sacred mm -hmm. and private and deeply meaningful. And, and secrets can be filled with numinosity. Uh, so this is a really bivalent concept here. And the sense of his own selfhood that this little mannequin in a matchbox gave Jung is something that I think kids and especially teenagers also experience. It may be something sort of contraband, like, you know, some kind of reading material, let's say, you know, that the teenager hides uh, under his mattress. But it may serve that same function of I am differentiating from my family and from my family values because I have this magazine that no one knows about and the secret knowledge that I'm pursuing. So some secrets are kind of developmental gestations. So I think of, you know, when a hen lays an egg and is <laughs> brooding over it and it's hatching, what's going on inside of the shell is a secret. And if the shell were cracked open prematurely, that the chick would die. I remember being in um, kindergarten and we would plant lima beans in our old milk cartons and we'd put them in the windowsill and watch them emerge. I remember on more than one occasion being impatient and, one, and digging down in the soil to kind of see what was going on. And of course, the plant would die. So, I mean, there's a secret going on under the soil, which is both compelling, but essential in order for something to emerge. So it can be very important for us to have secrets and to keep them. And Jung, in fact, says, man needs to have secrets. And I, I'm thinking about back to this idea about people coming into treatment with a secret, how those secrets are often both things that are very shameful that they've never told anyone, but also hold this very secret, private, sacred truth. So and what an honor it is to be entrusted with such a thing when someone comes in to analysis. And Jung says something about 
secrets having uh, an aspect of the confessional that you can tell your secrets in this safe place and be vulnerable, not be shamed, and that it creates uh, a new pathway for bonding with the therapist or analyst. And then the analytic consulting room is also a secret. Uh, this The client's secret is contained within a secret that uh, cannot be revealed. The analyst is bound to respect uh, his patient's confidentiality. Some analyst's offices are even arranged that way where there's one door where analysts walk in, and then there's a door in the back of the office where they leave by a different hallway. So even the fact that they are seeing the analyst is kept secret, which many people f- feel that they do need. The fact mm-hmm. that they're in treatment seems to be an important secret for them. Well, and part of that is perceived stigma about receiving mental health treatment, but it also is something more, I think, sometimes. I remember uh, being in training, and and some of us would not want to reveal with whom we were in analysis, which at first struck me as odd, but I have come to understand and appreciate that, that there's something, there can be something so sacred about the relationship that it really feels like you want to protect it and keep it secret and not make it a topic of sort of everyday chit chat. See, that's so important. And I think uh, the early analysts were very clear that what's talked about in the analysis is should never be discussed outside of the analysis. And they were thinking about it as a need to keep the emotional intensity alive around what is being worked through in order to facilitate any change in one's character. So if we think about one of the reasons that we tell our secrets to even a best friend is that there's so much intensity inside of ourselves that we want to kind of vent the kettle by um, speaking it to someone else. And in social work, they call it affective ventilation because attention is relieved in the body and the psyche. And then people can kind of return to what they consider their normal or homeostatic way of functioning. And that's fine if it's a toxic secret, but some secrets have the capacity to transform us and agreeing to keep them private facilitates that change. This relates very much, um, you know, to the concept uh, of the temenos, the sacred circle or the sacred precinct, uh, like, like a temple or a walled garden of some sort of special protected place where a secret can be shared and transformed. On the other hand, uh, sometimes uh, we can tell somebody something else in in a sort of confessional spirit, and it's just a palliative, you know, that I did this, you know, supposedly illicit behavior again this week, and I can tell this person, and uh, oh, what a relief. But then a week or two later, the same thing comes up, and it's not transformative. So I think that confessional and sharing aspect has two sides as well. Yeah. One of the things that's coming up for me in a slightly different direction is, you know, we've we've been talking about this importance of the temenos and holding secrets in this very careful way, whether it's in the analytic vessel or uh, a confessional situation. I'm aware that I think we're having a cultural shift in how we feel about secrets because it seems like, and I, I realize I'm going to sound like an old person, here, <laughs> but <it's, laughs> oh, it seems end. like, <laughs> <laughs> if I may, uh, younger generations just feel an almost compulsivity about sharing often highly sensitive personal things on social media. So the sense of Temenos, I think, is getting eroded a little bit. Is that fair to say? Absolutely. I think that living in a culture where there are no secrets, and by secrets we may just say privacy, you know, common privacy, has led to an epidemic of anxiety. Mm -hmm. I think that a lot of young people raised in this world where 
everything is known by everyone, are finding it hard to leave home, are finding that they're over-reliant on the parents and other systems to mediate the anxiety that they feel as they're interacting with the environment later in life. Well, I'm thinking about secrets or privacy that we may we want to hold for ourselves, and we can't because all of these algorithms on various social media sites and uh, consumer purchasing sites are being shared without our knowledge uh, everywhere. Yeah, so it makes it harder for us to hold on to this kind of individual identity that a secret can give us, that we are the only one who knows our preferences, say. But in fact, Deb, as you point out, that might not be true. You know, some algorithm might have figured out what our heart's desire is. Oh, every time I, uh, you know, go on Amazon, they pop up all the things that they think based on my past interests. I might be interested in. But I'm also thinking about what social media can do for people who post things on all of those kinds of sites of that those sites encourage us to present our persona. You know, the things we're creating, the wonderful places we've gone, a smiling, happy family, and all of that kind of thing, and thus separate ourselves from ourselves uh, it's a temptation to become identified with persona and uh, kind of repress or uh, create secrets that we don't want people to know about because of the pressure to present ourselves as healthy and happy and competent and successful. It really creates a split, I think, in a lot of people's psyches. I think that's right on, Deb. I think the whole idea of envy posting, where people are just generating idealized images of themselves in the hope that they will both be envied and validated and secretly feel very isolated, very unacknowledged, and very unseen in ways that are much more human and authentic. Yeah, shadow is very, very much denied. Uh, and we know, you know, just as you were saying earlier, Lisa, that those things that we deny repress, shut away, still take energy that keeps us from living as full and enlivened a life uh, as we might. I want to shift for a second and talk about secrets and dreams, because I think that there is always a secret at the heart of a dream, right? I mean, Mm. dreams are always a communication from the unconscious for the conscious mind to read and always include information that the conscious mind wasn't aware of before. And, uh, you know, in fact, Jung said at one point, he said that dream analysis, dream analysis leads straight to the deepest personal secrets. What's interesting about this is that Freud had a theory of dream interpretation that explicitly rested on this idea that the dream was a secret that had to be kept hidden from consciousness. Whereas Jung felt that the dream was conveying a secret that the unconscious was trying to communicate. I think that that's quite right. I often feel that in a course of analysis, when the ego, my ego and the client's ego, are kind of consulting with each other about what the priority is or what the area of work is going to be, that it can often feel very, I don't know, misdirected or dry. And it's only when dreams begin to be presented in the analysis that we often discover what the deeper priority is, which can sometimes be radically different from the reason that people thought they were initially coming in for treatment. Absolutely. And Jung is very clear about, in most cases, analysis of conscious material alone is insufficient. And that's why unconscious material, which is what we encounter in dreams, is so extremely important to understand. Yeah, so dreams can help us learn the secrets that we've been keeping from ourselves. Mm -hmm. And the timing of the revelation of secrets. So somebody may come in with a substantial wound, perhaps something really terrible happened in their childhood, which when they think about it is truly traumatic. 
but the dreams may suggest that there are 20 or 30 or 40 smaller secrets that are more titrated that need to be discussed in order to create a kind of ground initially, which can then contain something that is much more traumatic. I'd also like to make return just briefly to something that um, I think, Lisa, you had mentioned earlier, the idea that religious and spiritual experiences and ideas uh, may need to be kept secret, that the ancient rites of initiation or even the modern rites of initiation in organizations such as Freemasonry, they still maintain the value of certain secrets. And part of the thinking around that is that maintaining a secret by choice allows it to retain its numinous power. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I think is a shame is that many, or perhaps even all secrets, have been secularized uh, on the web and when something is secularized, its emotional and religious intensity flattens out, and it just becomes another kind of object or product for the ego to kind of toss around in different ways. And in that regard, it loses its transformational potential. Right. So there's something about intentionally containing a secret that protects that information, whatever it is, and sanctifies it and allows it, as you were saying, Joseph, before, to kind of gestate in the dark. You know, I'm thinking of this fairy tale called The Boy Who Could Keep a Secret, and it's a lovely, long fairy tale from one of the Andrew Lang uh, fairy tale books. I can't remember which now, which one right now. But um, it starts off with some really curious imagery. A boy, a little boy has a scabbard that grows as he grows. And one day uh, that he finds a sword and he has to wait for the sword to be big enough to fit into the scabbard. And then one day it is. And he slips it in and out and it slips in really easily. Now, this is some really interesting imagery, yeah. but <laughs> anything Freudian coming to mind? Yeah, my, Fre yeah, my Freudian, uh, my Freudian think hat is vibrating. Mm, um, I bet, is that the only thing that's vibrating? <laughs> that's it. That's it right now. At least that's all I'm willing to talk about. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> but, but he's so pleased with this. He's determined not to let his mother know about it because his mother could not keep secrets, but she could still tell that something was up. So she asked him what was going on. And he, uh, he says, Oh, well, I had such a nice dream last night, but I can't tell it to anybody. And so she beats him because he won't tell her his dream. And at this point, the story is a little unclear because we don't hear much more about the sword and the scabbard. The secret really does become a dream, even though it seems like the dream was a ruse to avoid talking about the sword. In any case, the story has all of these permutations where all these different people want to get the secret out of the boy, but he never tells anyone the secret. He says, I, I can't tell anyone the dream until it comes true. And uh, it, it seems to me that it's partly a dream about childhood abuse because his mother's beating him. And that is what sort of sets him on the road because a king comes along, asks why he's crying. And when he says his, his mother was beating him because he wouldn't tell her his dream, the king says, well, come and live with me. And there's all these adventures that he has. And finally, at the end, he becomes the king of... I think the king of Hungary is what happens. And he says, um, he goes back at the very end to see his mother. And he says, now, dear mother, you shall hear my secret at last. I dreamed that I should become king of Hungary and my dream has come true. When I was a child and you begged me to tell you, I had to keep silence. And if you had not beaten me, nothing would have happened that has happened, and I should not now be king of Hungary. So part of what I get from this fairy tale is this importance of keeping the secret 
and allowing it to gestate in the dark. And sometimes when we're in a situation where we're being abused or we're experiencing some kind of oppression or difficulty, the secret is even more important because it's like that part of our psyche that is secreted away where it can be protected and these dreams of overcoming the situation can continue to take form in the dark. I think that that's a a wonderful male initiation story, um, all joking aside. So he starts with his childhood and his sword is growing, which I think is an obvious phallic symbol. And then he goes through all of these kind of initiatic processes. And in the end, you know, he is able to step into the king archetype and the secret of his true emerging masculine nature can be spoken to the mother. Mm -hmm. And I think about particularly for boys, Boys deal with puberty, I think, very differently from girls, that as a boy begins to enter into puberty and his body changes, boys move into a state of tremendous secrecy. They do not want to talk about changes in their body or uh, the fact that they're masturbating or, or whether or not they have pubic hair. It's absolutely kept in the scabbard where he's learning about it, but does not want anyone to know about it until he emerges with enough masculine confidence to then enter into the world as a kind of openly sexual masculine being. And I find that uh, girls uh, are often much more open with their mothers, particularly about how their bodies are changing in this kind of initiatic arc into womanhood, which seems to be more communally affirmed and celebrated. But for boys, it's very much like this fairy tale, but it needs to be kept a secret until a certain point of maturation. And there's wisdom in that. I'm also appreciating in this fairy tale, oh, Lisa, how you said it was very convoluted, and then there was this, and then there was that, and so on and so forth, that the process of growing and developing ego strength, and in the context of this fairy tale, confident masculinity, And being able to reveal one's secret, having the wherewithal now to go back to mother and say, here's the story, is a very long and arduous and convoluted process. So there are times when it's right that we gestate a secret within ourselves, maybe that we keep a secret. There can be times when sharing a secret with someone creates a bond, whether that's Joseph, as you were alluding to earlier, we are part of a secret society where, uh, you know, the secrets are revealed in a, in a process of initiation. And then the fact that we all together know a secret is part of what sets us apart into our own group. And then there's the way that sharing a secret creates a bond. And I'm, I'm thinking back to our analytic situation that when someone comes in and shares their deepest secret with the analyst, that creates a very special kind of connection between the two of them, doesn't it? Yes, it does, because it takes a lot to risk shame or guilt uh, or the fear of retribution of some kind uh, to be that vulnerable and to feel um, that that secret part of yourself is going to be received without judgment and protected. That that brings back the temenos, the sacred space, uh, once again. And a relational, a new relational level of connection. I mean, we could actually say that there's a direct connection between sharing secrets and developing intimacy, isn't there? I mean, is it possible to have intimacy without having some shared secrets? I think not. And I think not only in the consulting room, but in other very close relationships. First, we have to be able to find ourselves and to see ourselves reflected lovingly in the eyes of another before we can really enhance or further develop our internal connection with ourselves. 
it's so important to have that uh, level of deep relational acceptance and intimacy. And I think your fairy tale illustrates that, that he didn't just, you know, do it all himself. He goes to the king and the king takes him in and mentors, fosters, protects this delicate stage of development. And then he can go back to his mother and say, hey, guess what, mom? Here's the deal. And that particularly in masculine psychology, the transition from the little boy who tells his mother everything, which both of you as moms know that time where as a toddler or late in that uh, process, six, seven, eight years old, you expect your little boy to, to externalize and tell you everything. And it's an enormous developmental time for a boy to decide that or to discover that keeping the mother outside of his psyche has to happen in order for him to become mature and to leave the house of the mother, which Jung wrote extensively about, that the mother complex in a man's psyche can uh, thwart him endlessly. I'm going back to the idea of disclosures kind of leading to intimacy. And it does lead to intimacy, but also there's a difficulty around discerning with some foresight how one's psyche will respond to certain disclosures. I've certainly seen people who came from very complicated childhood situations that develop what I would call promiscuous trust. Hmm. And they find themselves oversharing materials that should be kept secret or an inability to discern what an appropriately contained relationship would actually look look like or feel like. And then by violating their own internal world of secrets and treasures and suffering, that they create a kind of storm in their own bodies and psyches. And, and that's another very complicated phenomena, I think. Yeah, that's really interesting, Joseph. I think that's true. There's So there's some wisdom or discernment that goes along with knowing when to keep a secret and when to divulge it. I just want to turn and touch very briefly on secrets uh, much more in the extroverted or external world and how we keep secrets sometimes to protect people. Mm. You know, of course, I'm thinking about people that have been hidden away, the Underground Railroad where people secreted slaves away in the basements of churches or homes, people who hid Jews during the Nazi years in Germany. And I'm also just touching briefly on uh, how there are cultural norms about what is secret and what isn't, and that that can be very much sort of societally determined. So that's just a, a couple of very quick hits on those two areas. Yeah, the, those are important. Perhaps I could just finish with a, another quote from Jung about secrets. He says, it is not we who have secrets. It is the real secrets that have us. Mm-hmm. And with that, we'll switch to a dream. Hi, this is Lisa from This Union Life Podcast. Joseph, Deb, and I have been deeply moved by your responses to our work. Producing, editing, and distributing the podcast involves substantial expenses, and we need your help. Please stop by our website, thisunionlife.com, and click on the heading, Be Our Patron. You'll be redirected to our Patreon funding page. Patreon helps creators connect with people who believe in projects like ours. There, you can sign up with your credit card to support us for as little as a dollar a month, and at higher levels of support, we'll provide special episodes, behind-the-scenes photos and stories, and a chance to join a select pool of listeners for dream interpretations. Thank you. Okay, this week's uh, dreamer is a woman who is 45 years old, and she is a professor. Here's the dream. 
A man is recovering from an illness, sitting down on a chair. He calls me for protection. As I go forward toward him, he looks to his right side to some human figures, females, hidden in the dark. He is afraid of them, he tells me. I come close and hug him and notice that he has a very thick and voluminous hair. His hair emanates energy. I wake up feeling this high energy around my arms. And for context, the dreamer says that she had a discussion with a friend on that day because she felt her space had been trespassed. And being strong in her conversations and being able to be angry felt good as it allowed her to be loyal to a truth. And she adds that her feeling in the dream mainly was that she felt extremely energized by the hair of the man, and it felt good. So the the animus, perhaps, is recovering from an illness. So the inner masculine energy is, is recovering, but, but has been ill and needs the protection of the ego, by the way. So it's a really very interesting uh, initial situation of the interaction between this man recovering from an illness, calling on the ego, reaching out, the animus reaching out to the dream ego for protection. So we already have a dialogue starting. And I think it relates very much to um, the interaction that she says she had with the friend and being loyal to her truth and being able to confront the friend, even if angrily, uh, had something is a kind of parallel to this initial situation. Yes. So we might imagine perhaps that she's finding her uh, kind of assertiveness. The assertiveness might be related to the animus, perhaps. And the animus recovering from this illness, perhaps the illness relates to a kind of passivity. And now the recovery has to do with perhaps assertiveness. I find this dream very mysterious on a certain level. I'm listening to what you guys are saying, but I'm really steeping in it quietly. You guys keep going. I'll chime in. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm in a real reverie right now. Okay. Uh, well, I'm thinking then about where the dream uh, goes next. Uh, that The dream ego, our dreamer, goes toward the man, and he looks to his right side to some hidden female figures that are hidden in the dark, and he's afraid of them and tells the dream ego. So he has called on the dream ego for protection, and now here's the thing he wants to be protected from. Yeah, and that's so interesting, right? I wonder what about those female figures? We don't really know anything about them. No, and they're hidden in the dark. Yeah, so it's definitely something quite unconscious and... and. Uh, and perhaps, I mean, if we were going to go with the sort of classical formula, we might wonder about shadow contents. Yeah, you know, there is a, a some kind of a split between male and female imagery in this dream, uh, because our dreamer and dream ego is feminine. There's the man, and then there's a deeper level of of the feminine for for the inner male figure. So there's some split here, but the dream ego comes close and hugs him and does afford the protection, for, in other words, for which he has asked. And then we get this imagery about the hair. Yes. I'm thinking about this thick and uh, voluminous hair that emanates energy. And of course, I'm thinking about what is hair? I immediately thought about the story of Samson and Delilah, where his hair gave him power and strength, and when it was cut, uh, he became weak. Hair comes out of the head, where we, you know, think and uh, plan and kind of manage our lives. So th there's a huge energy association with hair. I think that um, for Robert Bly in his book Iron John that he looks at hairiness and hair as a symbol that is, again, particularly masculine, and that the modern 
strain for men to become hairless, to shave all their body hair or shave most of their head hair, he, he finds as a kind of assault against the masculine spirit. So even though this male figure appears to be recovering from an illness, there's something that is essentially masculine that is instinctive and connected really to his body, because the body generates hair, that still has energy, that is still vibrant, even though he is sick with fear. So to me, the illness is is really about fear. Mm. He's sick with fear about these mysterious, perhaps female figures that are hidden in the dark that neither she nor he can perceive. One of the things that um, I'm thinking about also relative to Jung's work, he said that complexes can develop such an astoundingly independent consciousness that they can generate their own fantasy material that needs to be examined by the analyst and the ego. So I think we have an example here of a, a complex that has its own set of fears that are making it it unwell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does. This figure does have a, a real sense of autonomy to him, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. So the inner masculine can represent all kind of things, um, and we wish she was here to ask. But yes, it could be the animus that her own inner masculine is somehow filled with fear, and particularly fear of the feminine. So one way that I could imagine that in a lived life, and our um, dreamer is a professor and therefore a researcher, that if the animus represents her own creative dynamism that is fearful of how the feminine will receive it. And I think about my friends that work as professors and the tremendous amount of anxiety about bringing forth some of their treasured resources because it will be mistreated by their community or invalidated, and how paralyzing that can be to one's creativity. So I'm having just a little bit of fantasy about how this might be living in her life and for the ego to feel that she can protect her own creative potential from this perhaps dangerous or negative feminine. You know, that feels very encouraging. And for her to be able to acknowledge that this creative potential still has power and strength in it, in the symbolism of the hair. I think all of that points to the beginning of a kind of creative process, but there still is a mystery about the dark side of her own femininity and how that might be paralyzing her spirit. That's a reference to the human figures, the females that are hidden in the dark from her animus? Yes, he's afraid of the female figures hidden in the dark. And I'm wondering that when a woman's creative spirit is afraid, and particularly afraid of the feminine mm -hmm. and or afraid of women. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would wonder about the mother complex, right? Mm -hmm. Other complex, sister complex, even. Yeah, yeah, and and in terms of the hair, you know, I'm I'm thinking of Samson. Yeah, mm -hmm. that, that's you know that this is this is where the mana is kind of located is in the hair. There there's some archetypal resonance for that. I'm also really interested in this how the energy when she woke up was around her arms. And uh, how, what agents uh, of agency, arms and hands are, as how we reach out, how we grasp things, how we, you know, operate things in the world. And that that's where the hair energy has gone is to, uh, you know, a kind of our, the action component of our bodies that's very much linked with ego. I mean, our arms do what we want them to do and operate machinery, drive cars, write letters, on and on and on. And that she experienced her interaction with her friend as empowering. And arms are our instruments of empowerment. 
still the mystery to me is the effect on the masculine figure. So the ego is aware of the man who's recovering, although that's the ego's interpretation. The one thing that the man tells her is that he's afraid of the female figures in the dark. So that's the only solid information. The rest is kind of speculated by the dream ego. She decides that she's going to respond perhaps to his anxiety by hugging him. And then some kind of virtue is transferred from him to her. Yeah, it's interesting because she's comforting him, but mm -hmm. he, but she's the one who receives this kind of energy. And it's unclear whether a medicinal event has happened for him. Mm -hmm. So if there was an opportunity to go in in active imagination and to allow the masculine figure to verbalize more of what it thinks it needs from yeah, her. Yeah, that, that would be a lovely exercise. It would, might be instructive in some way. Perhaps that's a good place to leave it for today. Yes. Perhaps so. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.